think the story of Wedded Digital as it's grown over the last three films has been a pretty amazing journey. You had this group of people who each year were just getting better at what they were doing. They were able to build on the experiences of the year before. The infrastructure, the organization, the pipelines were all, the software that was being written was all helping the following year as a much stronger base. Really the first film made us able to make the second film and the second film made us able to do the third film. Pete was able to come up with even cooler stuff for the third film because of the heartache and, and hardship that Weta Digital went through. Um, you know, the four years prior. Most facilities, when they get handed over, a, you know, one of the one of the major <laughs> blockbusters, is it's, it's a big show if you have 200 shots. In the Fellowship of the Ring, we did 540 shots. For the two towers, we did 799 shots. And for the Return of the King, we did 1,488 shots. What was most incredible about Return of the King as compared to the first two films was just the, the spectrum of work that we had to do. We had to cover not only creatures and characters, but environments and huge armies and things that got destroyed. Everywhere you were looking, we had to add something to the scene to make it real. We knew early on we were going to have to have a lot of work to finish this movie in a year. When you're in the thick of Return of the King with 1,500 shots, suddenly the, the 550 that we had on Fellowship seems like a picnic. We're working on the pre-visualization of the Battle of Pelennor Fields, which is, it's not really the climax of the Return of the King, but it is a very big central set piece kind of battle. Pre-visualization is kind of an advanced storyboard where you use a computer, you animate things, and you have the cameras, and you, and you create a pre-visualization of each shot or each scene so that you can show the director and the director can make direction choices or acting choices before they're on set and have to uh, commit to a lot of difficult visual effects setups. Peter, Richard Moore, and uh, Christian really had a lot of uh, pre-vis meetings where they sat down and decided how the battle was going to take place. The um, Palinor Field sequence originally started out with about 50,000 characters, but even as we started to lay them out in the, in, in the environment, we realized that 50,000 was a pretty small number of guys once you put them in this huge, huge environment with a big city in front of them. So when Christian started laying out the battle strategy, um, we realized we needed quite a lot more characters than that. So as we started to increase the numbers in order to create shots that looked good, we ended up with, you know, upwards 350,000 characters. It isn't flashy previs that we doctor up and give, you know, effects to and, you know, run through any sort of, you know, 2D compositing package. It's just fast, interactive stuff that can just get the bare blueprint of the shot out there for the people who really have to start doing the work and, you know, start, start making it look good. I mean, these trolls sort of tow them in and then they actually go around the back and start, you know, sort of loading the boulders on, you know. Yeah. And so it's this, the orcs right. are kind of cranking the machinery and, yeah, and then so the trolls go, you know, yeah. They would just sit in a room and quietly step through Pelennor Fields. And um, so what it was is they are off on their own. None of us really had, 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 had access to this little room that they were working at. It was sort of like it was sort of like a room in the Pentagon where the secret guys go and, you know, create the bombs that no one else really knows or wants to know exist. And there, I think there was a big sort of feeling of of that, of not wanting to know what the heck he was doing in there because it, it could be really scary. And then after a few seconds the the guys on you know the commander guys can sort of be doing a bit of a hey, hey, and the things are one by one the guys are squashed, you know, because that was quite effective. Rather than have them surviving, it's like it's a, it's a way in which you'd... And you could, you could shoot blue screen guys who kind of do it, and you just put them in 2D on sort of CG horses and just very quickly sort of have them squashed. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We probably thought that we were up for about 50 to 80 shots in Palinor Fields and it turned out to be when they finished on previous with the film about 250 at the end of the day. Um, and yes, things did get bigger and bigger. Peter turned over the, the entire sequence of Palinor Fields at once. 
And we hadn't seen a lot of it from the previous team, and so we finally got to see the full cut of it. The turnover is us looking at the sequence as a whole so we understand the context of what we're trying to do, and then going through the shots, shot by shot, so Peter can tell us specifically what he wants in each of the shots. And we'll bring a crew into, into that room. We'll have the heads of all the departments, camera, model, animation, everyone that, that would benefit from hearing what Peter has to say directly. And it was huge. It was all gray shaded creatures, early stages of animation. And he turned it over and it was just like, there you go. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> the kind of shots that, that Peter was sort of formulating for these things, it was almost, you know, documentary cameraman riding on the back of a horse underneath elephant legs and suddenly, boom, there goes somebody getting stepped on. And instead of being really excited, I think they were just really overwhelmed that we were going to finish this and we had five months left and we had this huge sequence to do. Everybody walked out of there the quietest in the universe. I think that was a turning point at Weta. You know, everybody just walked out of there and, and like just, Okay, we gotta get busy, you know? <laughs> you just leave this room going, what the hell did we just do? What, what, what you know, what is, you know, it, it would take you, it would take you a few hours sort of to sort of like come to grips with what was just, what, what just happened. One guy sent out email that just <laughs> had a path to this really long sequence. Um, and, he j and he had three words, oh my God, dot, 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 and we're just like, and then you hit play and watch it in the privacy of your own office going, you know, <laughs> white knuckle at the keyboard. So the big meeting, Peter comes in, conference room, we look at all the shots, everyone, everyone has, you know, sticks in their two cents. I remember that we were sitting there and we were talking about the attack on Minas Tirith more than anything and what the armies were going to be doing, where they were coming from, where they all, you know, played in this field that was, there was no such field in reality. And I can remember thinking at the time, oh my goodness, I wonder how we're going to make that. And I never for a moment thought that it would be totally a 3D environment. Well, as soon as we finished post-production on, uh, on film two back in November 2002, we started work with Alan Lee. Uh, I sat down with Alan Lee at a computer and designed Pelennor Fields. The actual full Pelennor Fields doesn't exist and never did exist, so the only option that we really had was to create it in a computer. We created a virtual location. In fact, um, Alan Lee, you know, drove a lot of the creation of the virtual landscape. He, he had the whole Pelennor Fields environment absolutely in his head, obviously, from the days of having to, to do watercolour paintings. I mean, Alan knows this world so well that he was able to give us reference for the basic layout of where everything was in relation to everything else, defining the Pelennor Fields um, arena. In order to create the um, environment, I basically created a map and some aerial drawings so that we could go into that 3D environment and look around and see what we would see from any direction. We had to build these environments as environments that we could actually move around in in three dimensions. So the whole idea of a map painting got extended into these incredible virtual sets. Alan Lee and Jeremy Bennett were art directors on the show. And what they did that was really so amazing, which is where I think art direction kind of reached new heights, is rather than just laying out conceptually what they thought everything should be like, they really got involved in figuring out specifically what the backgrounds and the scenes and the environments needed to be. So Alan and Jeremy would get very involved with going out on location, photographing things that represented starting points that we could use for look or lighting or pieces of terrain. So we called those tiles. They're basically a movie version of what people do with their cameras. If you're in a place and you want to take a, a big long photograph of a whole vista, you, you shoot a series of separate photographs and you kind of join them all together in, in your album, you know, like a, a montage. And, um, and, and we, we do that with the film cameras and we just stand there with the camera on a tripod and we just photograph a lot of different places and then in the computer they can join it all together and it becomes a sort of a cyclorama that you can use in the background if you ever need any more shots. 
Pelnor Fields was stitched together from multiple locations. Um, I mean, Twizel was really the main one where we shot the live action horse charging. We photographed mountains for the Minister of the Mountains. We, we photographed the Remarkables in Queenstown, which are particularly jagged mountain range for the Mordor Mountains. We took um, footage of rivers that become the, the, the Anduin River, which flows through the fields. We shot endless amounts of photography of grasslands around Twizel, which, which, which formed the grass. And we, we put all this together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And then it was my job, once those were kind of in place, to take these little bits and pieces of photographs and put them into a comp and build mountains, build hills, build, uh, you know, connecting landscapes, uh, build the Mordor Mountains, build a sky dome that sat around this whole thing. We took all those elements and put them together as the background around Pelennor Fields. We shot probably about a hundred skies around Wellington to try to come up with the right combinations of clouds and skies to get the dark Mordor gloom that that just lived over Pelennor Fields for the entire length of the battle. There was a point where the cloud would end, you know, it just it came out of Mordor, but, you know, a couple of miles either side of Minas Tirith, I think you'd probably see clear sky. And it certainly helped with um, conveying that feeling of depth in the environment. Once we started setting up the lighting for Pelennor Fields and realizing that we were gonna have this blanket of cloud that would allow light coming in from either direction, we quickly came to realize that that meant we were going to have two suns on Pelennor Fields. So if we were shooting one way and needed backlight, we had sun. If we were shooting the other way and needed backlight, we had sun. Uh, the thing that threw us off, though, is those suns were in the north and the south, not the east and the west. But that's the way it goes. You, know, you needed the bright background. You needed the contrasty foreground. The result was quite a realistic CG environment. So it became this big flat comp that once you turn into a circle, it became a world that we could sit a camera in the center of, move it around, and, and see anywhere we wanted to go. What that allowed us to do was to have the flexibility to, to drop in any kind of a shot that we needed. We could drop the camera down to the ground or we could fly it above Minas Tirith. We could go anywhere in Pelennor Fields and set up our shots and make them work. Peter told us um, at the end of um, at, at the end of film two that you know he really wanted to um, he wanted to make something that just made Helm's Deep look like a mild skirmish. The great thing with the technology that we devised over the years is that we were able to make continual improvements to it, and obviously the uh, massive software that was written for Lord of the Rings was a good case because we, we you know we wrote this to enable us to have these computer generated armies. Uh, which would behave naturally and, and, and look natural and look, not look like they were replicated bits of computer programming. Massive was really um, designed with the capabilities required for Return of the King in mind. Um, you know, dealing with hundreds of thousands of, of characters. So I knew that it couldn't just be a simple uh, crowd system for guys just running around and throwing things at each other because I already had read the scripts, all three scripts, and I knew exactly what was coming up. Well, I knew kind of what was coming up. A massive on Pelennor Fields went from about 10,000 uh, Urukai that we had in Helm's Deep to about 200,000 orcs that we had in Pelennor Fields. So it was a, a huge increase in the number of agents we had to have out there fighting that battle. The thing that got probably the most incredible was doing the massive horses for the Rohan Charge, because we had 6,000 horses and riders. When you're doing thousands of horses, you don't have enough labor and enough animators, good animators, to animate thousands of horses in these things. So you have to come up with some system that enables you to do that. We used Massive, but you still need to create that motion. And the way you create that motion is through a technique called motion capture. When we're putting together a, an agent for Massive, so the horses, they have to do a number of different motions. In fact, for the horses, we'd scripted those 450 motions. So we'd have um, particular actions of the horse standing still, moving forward, moving right at 45 degrees, moving left at 45 degrees, rearing up, galloping, cantering, 450 combinations of those. So when you see 6,000 horses running along and doing different things, they're all looking like unique, unique horses. You've got orcs coming at you all over the place. 
So you'll be, and you'll be interacting with each other and just moving around each other and trying to just hack and slash yeah. around. Yeah. Once we have shot the action in the, on the mocap stage, the motion capture team then takes the movement and refines it, just kind of irons out any kinks that, that might still be there. Then it will go to the massive team. The massive uh, horses would generally fill in the background. In some cases, you've got thousands and thousands of massive horses in the shot, and it's, and it's all digital. You also have the, the secondary task, which was uh, entirely animation, which was dangerous horse falls and deaths. These various violent actions, these violent horse takedowns, were then uh, done by the animators, and we basically gave, gave them carte blanche to you know, go in and create, you know, uh, exciting, dramatic, painful uh, impacts. The good news was that no uh, horses were harmed during this scene. The bad news is that a lot of animators were. There was a certain amount of that of the sequence with the horses that we wanted to shoot real horses against green screen. Um, a lot of them were CG, but some of them we wanted to be real. Some of them had um, actors on board as well. I was running out of time. I couldn't shoot all this material myself. So I thought the best person to shoot it would be Jim Rigel, who's our visual effects supervisor. And I thought, well, if Jim shoots it, he can't complain about what he's, what he's getting. In retrospect, it was brilliant of Peter to allow us to do this because, you know, he's on set. And, you know, we always grumble about later, oh, those elements, you know, and we didn't have a blue screen, and now we have to do this, and look at that, and now we gotta get that, we gotta roll her hair off, that tree, oh my God. You know, and he puts us out on the set. And the first thing we do is go, screw the blue screen, you know, we're gonna shoot the, <laughs> just go for it, you know, we're running out of time, let's go here, you know. And he puts us, you know, in just a small, small version of his seat. So I knew he'll do a good job because he knows, importantly, he knows exactly what he needs to get for the, to make the scenes work. As sort of graceful and gentle as you can do the whole thing too, the better. So if you can just sort of roll down, Mama Kill walks over and then get back up. I mean, you actually got up quite, quite nicely, so. So they took the previous cameras and Jim and his crew went out and shot a bunch of live action horses and riders running through the set. We basically did our best to sort of reference those previous is to get the camera moves correct. So when I went out onto the green screen battlefield, you would know to follow a horseman for a while and then at, at two seconds in, tilt up quickly to, to the sky, knowing that you were gonna put a giant mama kill in there that was gonna swoop back down and take out the horseman. And we'd be working till you know midnight, one, two in the morning after shooting all day and then present them to Peter the next day. And we're like, okay, and then this is like, you know, this shot is like this, and I was trying to find an element to work for here, and this didn't quite work. So he's like, not so easy, is it, guys? You know? <laughs> and it's, he's right. The live action plate shots enabled us to layer in computer-generated horses and computer-generated riders. So when you see a horse stumbling and fall on a rider going fl flying, that's obviously a horse that was computer generated and a rider that was computer generated. Um, but we allowed room by having the riders in lanes so that you had places to put these computer generated horses and make it look realistic. All of a sudden, you know, a couple of those uh, live action elements mixed in with the CG and assisted, you know, with massive behind that. We were like, that's real. The whole shot looks real now. <laughs> Mummick will really come into their own in film three. It's a little bit like Gollum popping up in film one, and then you know you really get to know him in film two. Pete held the Mummick off for film three, and uh, we spent a lot of time getting those guys right. Every department is working together trying to solve a lot of these problems. Um, the animators have to animate the weight of it to make it look realistic. The creatures department has to give the muscles dynamics that look realistic. The shots department has to give it lighting to make it look the size that it is in order to give that sense of weight. The compositing department has to create big dust clouds every time the, the mama kill lands his feet on the ground. So it's a process that covers the entire facility. 
And of course, one of the most extreme conditions was the shot where the two mama kill collapse into each other. That was a shot that we'd worked on for months and months and months to get all the details right because there was an amazing amount of effort that went into the animation and the creature work. When those two mama kills collapse, you know, there's bones breaking and, and muscles collapsing and, and uh, just a lot of effort into making that believable. That shot <laughs> was completely done <laughs> in our eyes. We were pretty happy with it. And Peter looked at it. And he said, you know, he sort of said something he's never said before. He goes, hmm. And, you know, and he, normally he's like, it, not, you know, fine. He's very vocal about it. But he went, hmm. And everyone just, mouth just dropped. Like, what are you talking about? And Peter remembered a better angle. He spent, you know, a while, a long time with the previs guys, prevising what he wanted Pelennor Field's battle to look like. And he created these really nice camera angles of, of the action, and, uh, and he remembered them, because he obviously was thinking about it. Well, it turns out we had missed one aspect of it, which was the camera move. In shooting the live action foregrounds for that shot, we got locked into a camera move that worked for the live action, that didn't quite have the same impact for the shot the way we had previsited. it. You always had the impact right in camera, and it was dynamic, and it was exciting. And somehow, we, you know, we, we tracked the evolution of the shot. And somehow, as the animation was getting refined and refined, they were scooting the camera in closer and closer until finally we're like underneath the mama kill looking up at her, you know? And it's like, well, of course, no wonder. The, Dylan was like, well, I'm like, well, what do we do? I mean, this reel's supposed to go out. We're gonna have to tell people we're holding the reel. This was two days before we had no more time. This was the drop dead. We worked for, I think, probably six months on that one shot alone. We figured out that if we just went with a completely digital version of the shot and didn't use any of the live action horses and riders, which we could do at that point, because by the end of the movie, we had the digital horses and riders working, that we could redo the entire shot. And Peter said, go for it. Fortunately, at this point, we were near the end of the schedule. We had, we had delivered a number of reels, and we had a huge resource available to us. We had all the top people that were there uh, that had just finished that shot. So basically, we redid it. You know, so a six month shot turned into a two day shot, basically. We had the uh, radically creative uh, uh, impulse to point the camera in the right place. We went back in and we presented it to Peter, and he's like, that's the shot. We had a meeting to discuss general ideas for Pelennor Fields, particularly to do with what we're going to do with the mummocks, because just trying to come up with ideas for how characters could try and take them down, basically. How do you take one of these things down? It's kind of a big question, really. There were some pretty strange um, ideas that, uh, that people had, and one of them was Legolas doing an action like climbing up arrows on, on the back of a mummy kill. And Peter really uh, took that and added to it and really developed it into the whole Legolas um, taking down the mama kill sequence. Orlando, you know, uh, is, you know, the new, the new uh, Errol Flynn. He's the new action hero. He uh, gets very excited about seeing these Douglas Fairbanks moments because it makes him look very cool. It was, it was a trip, man. I just, I was standing, I was there and he goes, so I've got this idea. You know, I love the way the, the, the audience responded to running over the top of the cage roll and, all, and, and, and sliding down the stairs and hopping onto the horse. And I want to I wanna have a leggy moment that just tops all of that. He wanted this big set piece with leggy on, on the back of the mama kill and taking down one of these huge, gnarly beasts. Then, so they're all crashed and the ghosts are dead into them. You then put an arrow through, through the brain of the bloody no beat, of the beast and as it falls down, you go for a scoot down down the trunk. <laughs> think you got problems. Orlando totally uh, convinces you that he really is on the back of this big thing. And so we ended up having to shoot the entire mimical sequence with Orlando in one day, which, you know, for its complexity is a very difficult thing to do. And we worked out um, the stuff we wanted Orlando to be really there for, the close-ups basically, all the way through the sequence. And in the space of a day, we quickly moved through and shot close-ups of him doing all the different bits and pieces that we needed them for. 
they just basically had me wired around and I was swinging and climbing and slashing and stabbing and I was like, wow. And uh, we shot him and then eventually Weta were able to extract him out of that footage and to place him on back of the animated mummical. And um, a lot of the most spectacular sequences in that mummical gag, uh, the, the spectacular stuff is really Orlando as a digital double. And on the, on the shot where the, the cage of the mummical is pulling over, he's a digital double as he rides the side of the mummical to the top. And then as the camera swings around, we just do an on-screen morph of him into the real Orlando that we shot during our pickup shoot on stage. Ridiculous stuff, really. Ridiculous. It shouldn't work at all. But it's wonderful, because it does. At one point, Peter said, let's have everything that we've got attacking Minas Tirith. So, of course, that meant trolls. These couldn't be the same dumb trolls that were, you know, in the other films because we needed them to perform as part of the army. People had only seen some rough previews and didn't really have a clear idea what was going on, and, and he basically wanted everything, <laughs> everything in the Weta digital arsenal to be thrown at our heroes. We're back in the, um, in the cutting room, and Peter's kind of, and I'm seeing all this stuff going on. This is great, this is great. And all of a sudden Peter goes, okay, and then the doors burst open, and then it's Annette's worst nightmare. Not only did Grand come through the door and we had, you know, every creature that you could possibly imagine, not one of those shots was shot on a blue screen. Basically what is being handed a shot that wasn't intended to be a visual effect shot, and all of a sudden it's become one. Pete's like, oh yeah, put a troll in the background there. And, oh, why don't we see a warg over there, that'd be cool. And I was like, oh my god, this is not just a little scene anymore. And this is October, he's turning this over. Given how brilliant our crew was, they attacked them with a vengeance and did such a stunning job of them. But that is a production manager's nightmare where you, you were given shots that, that weren't shot to be used the way they were and suddenly you are absolutely having to unravel it and redo it. <laughs> Peter Jackson decided that he had one extra scene to deliver that involved the troll. It was eight or six weeks before deadline, and that kind of put me off sleep for a night or two. It was like, oh God. Basically, the orcs start pouring in. Peter said, well, I'm going to make these optional. But I thought it'd be really cool if we had some really big battle trolls. It's all optional. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. It's like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean we don't have to do it? Of course we have to do it. It's, what does optional mean from Peter Jackson, you know? And we would joke about it. Can we choose other optional shots, you know? No. We're so used to, you know, his, the way he, t the way Peter turns over, um, that it didn't even, it wasn't even daunting, really. We just were like, okay, we'll do that. And he's right, he's right. That's the thing is, he's always right. You know, that's, that's why you can, never get, you can never get angry, you can never get mad, because ultimately, that's what we're all there for. We're all there to make an incredible movie, and we're all killing ourselves to do it. And so, what, you know, whatever it takes, and, and we all have, you know, 100% faith that that's what Peter is, is creating. <laughs> Is Peter Jackson, in fact, arachnophobic? Is he? I think I heard that. Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. That's good. Sissy. It was told to us early on that Peter was an arachnophobe, which I thought was pretty funny, because he was really excited about the Shelob sequence. So Peter started thinking about, you know, what he had always feared in spiders and, and what made him cringe. And basically, I wanted to create a scene that scared the hell out of me. We ended up getting this um, really gorgeous detailed maquette um, that had been sculpted up and cast in the workshop. In film three we had latched onto some new scanning technology that we hadn't used um, in either films one or film two, which is being offered by a company in Canada. We sent the Shelob um, maquette across to them. The level of detail that they were scanning to was, was way beyond anything I'd seen before. They were scanning like 10 times more detail than, than we'd been able to scan ourselves and the scan we got back uh, was phenomenal. So we scanned it and got Shelob looking like this old, decrepit creature, but still not a real spider. 
the last thing we want it to look like is a big CG spider. So you have to you have to try to figure out ways to to tweak things around a little. Shelob had I think 12 layers of texture on her. I mean it was just all sorts of layered upon layer to help sell the leatheriness, the the slimy skin, the the pussy pores, the you know just all the different kind of material properties over the skin. Things like that are subtle little clues that you don't necessarily consciously pick up on, but subconsciously you you really kind of can perceive that this thing is a big creature versus something that's a little small thing that they tried to kind of make look big. Once we got the look of it going, then it became the motion of this spider. We had to do a lot of research on how a real spider would move and how Shelob might be different. I wanted to somehow capture that speed but not make it look too fast because when you're dealing with a big object like Shelob it's as, it can look very unnatural if that moves too quickly. So we just had to do a lot of experimentation to find the right um, degree of speed. What Peter wanted was a real sense of intelligence behind what Shelob did. So Shelob basically has to move like a spider and perform like a diva. Julian Butler put the animation controls into the, the model that he got from the model department and we put our animation on the puppet that we got from him in the creature department. We would you know, look at what was happening in the plate and try to match our Shelob to what was being done by Sean Astin in the plate. So from there, we would really quickly just block out the shot. We would just move Shelob wherever she needed to be in the frame and then animate her body to what Sean Astin was doing. You know, if Sean was swinging a sword like that, have her move over here and just animate her body the way it should go. And then Peter thought, well, why don't we just up the ante a little bit? So he came up with this idea of, of having Shelob drive Sam up the wall of the cave and, and fight up with her up on top of the wall for a while and then flip down her back and roll down before he was able to grab the sword and, and stab her. The first part of that shot was all digital double Sam. Chris George did a great job of this three or four frame transition between my Sam and the real one that even now I can't really tell where the handoff is. So he fooled me. When we started looking at the destruction of Baradur, um, in order to make that believable, the scale really becomes important. This was a tower that was, you know, something like close to a mile high. And so there was no practical way to build a miniature at that size or to shoot it at that scale to make it believable. We need to feel that it's falling and really feel the massive, you know, pieces coming through and crumbling and hitting and, and falling. And I think everyone started to see that it's going to be really hard <laughs> to get this to be a practical model. I said to Weta, look, you know, we should be thinking about trying to do this as a digital tower because at least then we can control it, we can have it collapse exactly as we want. And, and Gray Horsfeld at Weta, one of our technical directors and modelers, he just single-handedly mm -hmm. spent his entire Christmas break building the digital Baradur. I actually said it at the beginning of the film three, it's going to be easy, it's going to be fine, it's just one shot. <laughs> Little did I know. Gray decided that he didn't need a break. So he talked the um, support guys into setting him up with a, a workstation at home and he had two or three photographs of the miniature but very little to go on. I started it at the, uh, at the point where Waiter broke for Christmas um, and it was basically two weeks of 18 hour days and seven day weeks and uh, lots, of, lots of frustration. We all came back after the two week break and Grey turns up with a hero digital model of Baradur with something like 800,000 custom handcrafted poly faces. That was just like, wow, did you sleep at all during that two weeks? Did you ever leave the workstation? It was like a feat of modeling that um, may never be surpassed. It wasn't so much that the model could be built or could be made to look real, but it was that in order to have a mile high tower collapse. It involved simulation that previously had never been done and that hasn't been possible. It actually goes against the way a computer naturally wants to think. He was so into this sequence and to make it work as well as it did. Uh, and he put all his effort into it and uh, really did a stunning job.
we had just finished up the final, the last shot of the Baradour sequence, and I was done on the show. Um, there was, I think there's maybe only a couple more days left in the schedule. And I was just up um, talking to one of the coordinators, and somebody came in and said, Hey, you doing anything? I was like, No, not really. So, like, you want to give us a hand? I'm like, what? Kill Gollum. Yeah! I still think that Gollum is such a Hollywood. He's such a little drama queen and and I don't I don't feel like he's dead, you know. He he became a real character to me. Yeah, the shot of Gollum falling into the lava was the first shot Peter gave us on Return of the King and the, almost the last one to finish. It had to be just right. And so we spent months and months just working out the performance. We had Andy do a bit of the performance for us. On the motion capture stage, I shot numerous versions of um, the dance of joy t tumbling backwards, the ground giving way beneath. But uh, ultimately, it, it became a, an animated performance because there was no way you could motion capture anything like that kind of a fall. Despite all the technical challenges, and it was a really difficult shot to do because of the chasm and the lava and everything that needed to happen, the most important thing was Gollum's performance. How does he die? And what's his last expression? And what is the last moment that we're spotting? Is, is it his mouth? Is it his eye? Is it, you know, what is it? And originally, we, you know, we'd, ah, we, you know, we'd storyboarded him screaming and his skin, you know, starting to burn and stuff. But when it came down to doing the shot, you know, Pete sort of said, look, no, no, we're not, we're not, not going to have him writhing around in pain. He's not thinking about the fact that he's burning up at this moment. He's, he's thinking about the fact that the rings betrayed him. And that's the sort of the, the driving thought behind his reaction. It, w it was definitely, definitely a good, you know, good call, I think, but, but difficult to portray. I mean, he's thrashing around the lob, and yet he's having this very introspective moment. So somehow, you know, had to try to get this across and, and took the facial expressions and um, pared it down a bit, made it a bit more subtle, made it a bit more introspective. And I think that maybe biologically that's not right, but uh, poetically it is. He's he's been a part of you for this whole ride. It's like how can you not? How can you? How can you just say like, oh, well, they need help killing Gollum. I gotta go. You, you gotta jump in there and kill Gollum. It's like you always kill the ones you love, right? good for everybody to be able to see their work um, on the big screen. So we decided to do a, every month a screening of everybody's you know, final shots. Monthlies are a way of, of taking a look at all the work that was done on the film for the entire month so the whole crew can see what was going on and just kind of get a feel for, for, for what everyone else has been up to and where it's going. All their work, they could finally see it on film and then you could hear their reactions if they saw you know, a Felby's flying through, you know, one of their miniatures or whatever, you'd hear certain sections of the room light up in applause because they were just so jazzed to see their work. Hey. Hey. Hi, Mom. What about us? Hi. Hi. It's over. For the last month of review we had, it was huge. We had, um, it was about 800 shots and it went for 45 minutes. So I think that was when it was kind of sad that it was all over because it was, you know, you were there with a lot of people that had worked really hard you know, and all on the same project, you know, just so many creative artists. And um, Peter gave a great speech. So, I'd just like to obviously thank you all very much. I mean, thank you, such a pathetic thing to say after all the work that everybody's put in. And, um, you know, it's, 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 for me, these films have been a dream come true as well. I've just been dreaming and thinking about visual effects since I was about seven years old. And, uh, you know, and I have to say, quite truly that the, the work and the shots that I've been seeing over the last few months have just blown me away. I mean, I've just been so excited. And actually in, in complete awe of the quality of the work, because even following the first two films, you know, this third movie has just had such a quantum leap. Um, it's incredible. And, you know, it's a wonderful situation now because we all know what we've just been through and what we've done, but the rest of the world doesn't. And there's this kind of great kind of anticipation that I have now. For, you know, wait, wait till they see this. I was actually getting chills through the whole thing because I'm looking at these shots, and I think I 
didn't quite realize what we did, you know, because you get so tunnel visioned in, in when you're working on these things. When you saw that stuff go up on the screen on that last, you know, big monthly presentation, you were like, man, we did do it. You know, we did finish all those shots. You know, I'm getting a stomachache thinking about it. It's, we actually did finish. People loved it. People were clapping and howling and the shot and seeing all the shots, the final shots, you know, no one, they'd gone in so quickly, no one had really gotten a chance to really see everything. Not only were the shots big shots, they were ginormous shots. Every shot that was on that screen at Monthly's was like, wow. People are freaking out. The word is, you know, after on the street afterwards was, the world has no idea what's about to be unleashed upon them. They have no idea that this is going to come out and, and they're going to see this amazing <laughs> body of work, you know? And it was, everybody was just flying high that, that night. And so when we came out, yeah, it was like a big secret. You know, you're not allowed any way to tell, show the world your pictures, but you really do. It's like you want to get out your baby pictures, you know? Look. The team that's evolved at Weta Digital has just been fantastic. It really feels like in the last film, everyone on the crew was just working to their peak abilities. It's taken a lot of effort, a lot of heart, a lot of creativity, a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of pretty much anything you can think of to make it work has, has come together in this one place. He's a good animator, though. It's a facility-making project. People are talking about Weta Digital now as one of the, the top few handful of, of visual effects facilities in the world because we've had this great show to build the facility on. It's unbelievable what everybody went through to finish this film. And, and, and after it was all over, you know, I talked to people and I said, well, you probably hate me and you'll never come back. And they said it was the best time they ever had. There was so much passion for this movie and to get this movie done and make it look as good as possible that nobody quit. There was just so much a love for it and obsession. Everybody was obsessed. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> we all had to believe that the guy who'd made, you know, the splatter films could then do a David Lean meets Ray Harryhausen extravaganza of a type that had never been achieved before. And if you'd known him then, I think you would have believed it too. We don't need the awards to tell us. You sit and you watch a shot, and sometimes it brings tears to your eyes because it is so rewarding. The results are there on screen, and they're there for all time. And so, yeah, the crew definitely pulled together because they knew that they were working on something that was spectacular and that they'd always feel proud of.